Okay, the reason why we started working on, on this kind of uh, issue is that we discovered that a number of big business lobby groups uh, had started to see um, the euro crisis as an opportunity to uh, implement some, some key reforms in the European Union. Um, they had been complaining for five, seven, eight years that there, are no, there were no rules in place that would enable the European Union to influence uh, national labor laws push down wages, basically. Uh, there was no rules in place to uh, influence uh, member state budgets decisively. What they wanted, basically, was to um, uh, launch an attack on, on social expenditure. And the third one was to have uh, pension reforms. They felt that there was some kind of tool needed at the European level to, uh, to, uh, to impose those reforms. Now, um, a lot, of, a lot has happened since then that pretty much play, uh, plays into, into their hands, starting in, uh, in spring 2010 with a, a pretty far-reaching decision by the European Council on, uh, on coming reforms. I remember that shortly after that summit, uh, um, uh, President Barroso from the Commission uh, gave a, a talk at a university in, in, in Italy and he said something along the lines that this is this is a silent re revolution we're experiencing. Uh, and he added, I really hope that the council understood what they decided today. This, this would really, this would really uh, take us far. Since, since then, what have we had? We've had uh, a new system of uh, budgetary surveillance, surveillance of member state budgets for the, uh, uh, the European semester which means that uh, there will be a pretty long debate on member states' budgets well before it's even discussed in national parliaments. We've seen a pretty uh, uh, tough reforms on, um, on the stability pact, which means that in the future, when a country has a deficit that's a bit too high, it will pretty, pretty swiftly be thrown into a procedure where uh, its economic policies will be more or less determined by the council. And if they don't, they will be fined. Fines have been uh, have been raised. It can go all the way up to 0.5% of, uh, of GDP. Uh, then we have a new procedure on macroeconomic imbalances that will actually allow uh, the council to interfere in almost any kind of economic policy of, uh, of member states. There is the Euro Plus Pact. There is uh, the Fiscal Compact that we're discussing today. And there will be uh, uh, more. There are more uh, initiatives uh, in in the tube. So where will all this take us? I think to me it's been very very instructive to uh, to visit Brussels, and I'm there a couple of times a month, and sort of uh, sense the atmosphere and hear what commissioners and MEPs, uh, members of the European Parliament, how they see this uh, wave of of, uh, of reforms. And during my talk, I will return a couple of times to a conference I attended about a year ago in Brussels, organized by the Commission. Uh, a lot of the work I do is still fueled by uh, some of the provoking statements that came out of, the, uh, of that conference. I think, in general, you should, you should understand that in Brussels at the moment, um, people in the European Parliament and in the Commission are bubbling with self-confidence. They believe that they have the proper cure for the economic ills of the European Union. And very often you will hear them make statements about member state governments, that they are too slow to understand, uh, that you will hear them uh, say a lot about some national parliaments, that they are working too slow. Uh, so in general the feel is that um, they feel that they are in a capacity to, uh, to solve uh, a lot of uh, key economic issues. I want to make six points about uh, the development we've seen about uh, for the past uh, two years. The first point is that the reforms we've seen, does lit do, they do little or nothing to solve the current crisis. That's not what they're, what they're about. At this particular conference, it was a, a, a conference, it was a pretty typical Brussels thing. Uh, the Commission had uh, invited all its friends to pat it on the back and say, well done, and please continue uh, your work. But there was one guy in the panel, an economist, who turned out to be uh, some, some, a kind of opposition, you could say. 
and he asked very insistently the guys from the commission. Now all those reforms you have on, on your table, on budgetary surveillance, castigating countries in deficit and so forth, will they do anything to solve the present crisis? Because you couldn't see that at all. Then a guy from the commission stepped up, I think he, you could, it's fair to say he's uh, Uli Rehn's uh, uh, right hand. He said, well, I don't think that's entirely fair because there are investment banks on financial markets who say they would like to see this kind of reforms. <laughs> <laughs> and that was all. He said nothing else. So that was the justification for far-reaching reforms. Uh, so it's not about this crisis, it's about something else. Second, why the hurry? I mean, uh, I just mentioned a number of initiatives and there are more coming up and it, this is all done in a fever, feverish pace, happening very, very quickly, for at least for European uh, Union uh, standards. I think, I think to some extent uh, we have to uh, see this uh, development as uh, something that uh, very powerful circles in the European Union have wished for for a very long time. And the crisis is but an opportunity to them. Uh, at this particular conference we had a guy called Mario Monti. He's now known as the uh, uh, as head of the Italian government. He used to be a commissioner and has been for several years. He stood up at, at this conference and said, well, actually, this is the kind of reforms I proposed as a commissioner in 2005, but they were rejected by the council. So that I can only say one thing, thank you, Greek crisis. <laughs> I think it was meant to be funny. I personally, I found it extremely cynical, but uh, th I mean, there you had it. There you had it. The, the crisis was seen by him as an opportunity to have the reforms he had wished for for a long time. That was the second point. Third point, these these are neoliberal policies made, EU law. Uh, it's about low wages, it's about uh, pension reforms, it's about austerity and austerity and austerity. They are being presented to us as a cure to, uh, to lack of competitiveness or the like, but it is a very, very political and a political phenomenon and it should be politicized. If, for instance, you listen to uh, the way the, comp the issue of competitiveness is being discussed, discussed in Brussels today, what is competitiveness? Well, the way to go there is to have low wages and very, very low public expenditure. Now, looking at the Nordic countries, ranking among the highest in the world in competitiveness, did we get to that point because of low wages and low public expenditure? I think there's something wrong with the history book there. <laughs> Point number four. This expands the competence of the European Union dramatically, and it's happened in no time. If you go back five years, could you even imagine, for instance, someone proposed that the EU should start meddling in wage setting and wage policy? Well, maybe five years ago, but not six years ago. Could you imagine, could you imagine someone who would say, well, in order to make a sound budget at the national level, first you'll have, it approved, you'll have to have it approved by the Council and the Commission, and the Commission should be in a position to advise you on the specific points of your policy. It would not have happened. But these days, it's, it's become, I'm not saying it's becoming acceptable, because I think very few people really know much about it, but it's, it's, being, it's being implemented in, uh, in, in, in no time, and it... Uh, in, in my view, it even breaks the, the uh, limits in, uh, in the treaty. Fifth point. A lot of this will be implemented via very, very technocratic procedures that very few understand today and that very few will understand in a year's time because they are technical, because they are not particularly transparent. Um, one example of how this works, and as, um, maybe some of you will be familiar with a report that came out uh, last week on what is called the macroeconomic imbalances procedure. Does that strike a chord? Well, if not, let me tell you that in there it reads that Finland has a serious problem with its, with its wages. And it's not, I mean, it's imaginable that sometime end of this year 
very specific recommendations will be passed to the, uh, to the Finnish government. You have to do something about uh, wages in Finland. We suggest, I think that will be the normal approach, we suggest that you start with the public wages, then sooner or later there will be contagion to, 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 to the private sector as well. I mean, uh, we had court cases four or five years ago that touched upon labor legislation. I, I'm guessing that in Finland the Viking case was an issue. This is ten times worse than the white Viking case. This is ten times more intrusive uh, on, uh, in, uh, on the labor market. So that's the fifth one. Uh, very few will be able to follow it, and it will be practically immune to uh, to uh, public interference and any real democratic debate. Six points. Uh, the reforms are inherently uh, maybe not undemocratic. If I would prefer to call them anti-democratic. What is the essence of uh, this whole exercise? is to have economic policies be decided on in pretty closed rooms in Brussels. Governments will certainly be there, but in terms of public influence, that is, I think, something that is being uh, willingly reduced as much as possible.